My name is Rebecca Bowling, and I am the director of the Drescher Center for the Humanities, and I'd like to thank you and welcome you to this Humanities Forum event today, which is co-sponsored by the Library and Gallery. Um, today's, um, before I talk about today's lecture and make some introductions, I'd also like to remind you that right after spring break on that very Monday after the break on the 26th of March, our next talk will be by a philosopher Lucian Stone, talking about the regression of listening to the Middle Eastern other. Um, so I invite you to come back on the 26th. Um, and to also, if you don't have one, to pick up these brochures, which are around the room. So um, to remind you of what's coming up when. Today's lecture is the Daphne Harrison Lecture, named after Professor Emerita, Dr. Daphne Harrison. Dr. Harrison is the former chair of the Department of Africana Studies and the founding director of the Humanities Scholars Program and UMBC Center for the Humanities, the predecessor to what is now the Drescher Center for the Humanities. Dr. Harrison came to UMBC in 1972 as an associate professor of Africana Studies. In addition to her work teacher, during which she spearheaded a two-year effort by UMBC and Baltimore school teachers to dis discuss racism, she also acted as founding director of, our, of the center until her retirement in 1999. A scholar of music, she also has published a number of articles about the blues and has written a book entitled Black Pearls, Blues Queens of the 1920s. As a professor and faculty colleague, Dr. Harrison relished working with a variety of campus groups, including gender and women's studies, the Music Department, the Meyerhoff Scholarship Program, and others. To quote her, I love teaching and enjoy challenging students to be imaginative, to take risk, to stand up for what is right, regardless of peer pressure. As a result, I fell in love with every new group of students that walked into my classroom. As the first director of the Center for the Humanities, she worked tirelessly to recruit faculty to teach the humanities scholars and to mentor both the scholars and their professors, of which I had the pleasure of being one, as well as to bring in challenging speakers as part of the Humanities Forum Lecture Series. Dr. Harrison is with us this afternoon, and I'd like to ask her to stand so that we can acknowledge her. now Tom Beck, who is Affiliate Associate Professor of Photography in UMBC's Visual Arts Department and better known to probably to most of you as the Chief Curator of the Alvin O. Kuhn Library and Gallery. And he in turn will be introducing our guest speaker. Thank you, Rebecca. It's so nice to see Daphne and Daniel here today. It has been a magnificent partnership uh, between the Drescher Center and the Humanities Forum to have them gather in this space, and especially on this occasion uh, when we have uh, uh, this magnificent program. Uh, the uh, Stephen Mark Passage on the Underground Railroad Exhibition was the occasion that we could do this. Um, originally organized by the University of Buffalo Art Galleries, we were able to bring the show here, and uh, it was magnificently done by uh, Miss Emily Halver, our curator of exhibitions, uh, and the design of uh, the exhibition in part, and the card advertising it was done by Professor Peggy Ray of the Visual Arts Department. She has been a great supporter of us for many years, and I'd like to also say that uh, uh, Larry Halver has been a great uh, support for the installation of our exhibition. So let's give them all a round of applause. Please. Uh, there are other people I'd like to acknowledge. Um, first, uh, the Friends of the Library and Gallery have been strong supporters of the gallery over the years, and they have given annual support to us, which helps us uh, match our grants. Um, speaking of grants, uh, we've had uh, an arts program grant from the Maryland State Arts Council uh, this year and in previous years, and that is a, an organization funded by grants from the National Endowment for the Arts. 
And we also have a grant from the Baltimore County Commission on the Arts and Sciences, and uh, we are delighted that they give us that support. Uh, and not least in our, in our uh, thoughts is Dr. Larry Wilt, uh, who for many years has been a strong supporter of the Library of Gallery, and we thank him very much for his efforts. Now, Stephen Mark. Uh, it is my great, great pleasure to introduce Stephen Mark. Uh, he is a person who has exhibited in this space before. Uh, he was part of our exhibition, and here's the catalog, uh, called Visual Brios in 1993. Uh, he is um, a person who uh, came from uh, a small town background in rural Illinois, grew up partly in Springfield, Illinois, uh, and then Chicago, where he grew to adulthood. And uh, in Chicago, he, um, he you know, lived there for a time, but he went to uh, college at, uh, got his BA degree from Pomona College in uh, California, and then crossed the country again. This is, this is a man who has crisscrossed this country all of his life. Uh, he went to Temple University for his MFA degree in photography and at the Tyler School of Art there. And, um, he returned to Chicago, which uh, began his exploration of the African diaspora. In particular, uh, he did a body of work, which he will tell you about, called Urban Notions. And, and one of the things that fascinates me is how this exhibition is part of a direct timeline that comes from Urban Notions through his uh, work called the Black Transatlantic Experience, which included a lot of the kinds of things that he photographed in Urban Notions, which was gesture uh, and style, uh, how that uh, was translated uh, to photographing the As African diaspora in England, and Ghana, Jamaica, and in the United States. Uh, the photographs that uh, he did uh, at those times connected African American communities uh, across the country and around the world. Uh, but always there was an embedded warmth in his photographs. And in 1992, uh, he brought out uh, a book uh, that, um, you know, called The Black Transatlantic Experience, which then led to, I think, one of his most pioneering bodies of work called Soul Searching. And I imagine he'll show you some of that. And it was that work that we showed here in the library gallery, and it's that work that we have in the special collections uh, in the, the, the library here. Uh, these were the, the soul-searching images were black and white primarily, uh, but he moved into color quickly, and it's, I think, the translation of the color from that body of work into Passage on the Underground Railroad that, that made his work so rich. Uh, his work is included in prestigious institutions, including UMBC's photography collections, as I said. He has had uh, no less than 69 one-person exhibitions across the country and around the world. And he has had pages and pages of uh, group shows and more pages and pages of publications of his work in journals and, and other books. So uh, he uh, has been honored by his colleagues by having his uh, work put onto the cover of the journal called Exposure. Uh, this was uh, in uh, 2002. The Exposure is the Journal of the Society for Photographic Education. It's the academic organization devoted to photography across the country. And so that was a tremendous honor for him to be selected for that occasion. But he has had other honors as well. He's the recipient of significant awards, including the Elizabeth and Mallory Factor Prize in Southern Art. And he's had commissions in Chicago, uh, Chicago's Avalon Public Library, and the Chicago Transit Authority, 79th Street Station. Those are very competitive kinds of uh, competitions. He is a pioneer in making meaningful work in both photography and digital imagery. I present to you Stephen Mark, who will speak to you about his work on the Underground Railroad and give us insights into the black experience and the history of the United States. Stephen Mark. Each other. It's been incredible, and uh, it's wonderful being back in this space. I always enjoy being here. 
A um, couple of things. What you see are some of the pieces that are building up and breaking down in terms of different layers. And I'm going to be able to show you how some of the pieces are created that are up here and uh, you know, how they're constructed. And um, the other thing is that um, if you have any questions, I strongly encourage you to ask. I have more work up here that I'm going to have a chance to show you. That's not the important part. The important is I want to make sure that I address some of the things that you want to see and answer some of the questions for you. So fortunately, I have things set up where everything is not in a linear form. So what you're seeing is pieces building up. Okay? You're seeing pieces building up and breaking down. And I'll bring back another one, too, because for those who are in here a little bit earlier, you might have seen the one here. And what this is, is one of the slave castles in Ghana. I went to the forts at um, Elmina and also at Cape Coast. So you're seeing where I'm starting to build up the patterns, you know, in the pieces. And um, so the piece build up and you see it break down. And this is one of the images from the, um, from the Soul Searching series. And it's where I was working with um, self portraits, photographs from the family archives, um, found images, or what some of the antique stores refer to as instant relatives. Um, and so, um, but what I found is that as I was working with the family album, um, more things were coming out about the family than the family was open and willing to often talk about. Um, I'll go back to this other one right here also, because um, what you see at the beginning, or you see building up, is the, um, is the word drapedomania. And drapedomania is the 1851 pseudoscientific term coined by Dr. Samuel Cartwright of the um, mental defect and deficiency that caused the slaves to want to run away. And so what you have here are from the different postcards, trade cards, as well as going across the top of the mountain, some of the runaway ads, the many different figures of the, what I refer to as the running man. So you have the inky racer, you know, the inky eraser guy there, you have the ads um, from uh, meatpacking companies, etc. but everybody's on the move. And so since this was the pseudoscientific mental defect, um, that's why I also took the liberties, for anybody that knows this territory, to actually have everybody running from Ohio back to Kentucky. <laughs> and so that's a little side note with that one. So you kind of see where that comes in. So I just wanted to kind of get a sense of, you know, kind of seeing how some of the pieces were put together. Now, does anybody have any questions at all? Are we get started? Okay, you ready? Questions? Okay, you can always ask later. Um, since um, I'm going to show you a couple of things here, and, um, the books are actually in the display case back here for Urban Notions that I did in 83, The Black Transatlantic Experience in 92, and Passage on Underground Railroad, which I just did in 09. So although the case is locked over here, these are my copies, so you are free and welcome to come up and actually kind of take a look through them. And to actually do the books is um, many stories, and longer than I can ever kind of tell you with this. However, um, one thing I should tell you is that um, sort of the star of Urban Notions is my god brother, who is actually the little profile you see over to the right. But the person leaning into the car is Ruby in English. And Ruby is my cousin, our bridge club, our, our families played bridge together and uh, since we were little. And so uh, this is one of my cousins who was the designer of both Urban Notions, the Black Transatlantic Experience, and owe him a great deal of thanks for when Passage on the Ground Railroad was um, not done properly. He stepped in and made sure the design work was taken care of properly on that. He was a design the University of Chicago Press and Journalist Division. So at any rate, um, you're actually sort of seeing him in the pieces as well. And Urban Notions was when I first got out of school. And I went back to Chicago, and I started looking at the little triangle that I grew up in, which was Springfield, Champaign, and Chicago. And starting to look at, I traveled growing up, so that my cousin's grandparents were in Springfield. I had an aunt and uncle who were more like my grandparents, because my grandparents on my mother's side were deceased by the time I was born, so I had an older aunt and uncle who sort of took over that role. And then, um, and then I moved to Chicago. But I went back and forth quite a bit, so there are probably still some people in Champaign right now who still think that I live there, and they just haven't seen me for a while. Although I've been living in Arizona for 14 years now. And so each one of these has many different stories that I could tell you with it. So um, I'll try to keep it conservative, and so if there is something you're curious about, raise your hand away. But um, this is actually a, um, give you an idea, this is actually a store, that store in Chicago, on 87th Street. And I saw the fish, and they were very interesting. And so I'm standing outside the store, plugging the little PC connect to my 35 millimeter camera, and I'm feeding out the cord as my god brother walks in the store, and he's holding the flash underneath his face, and I'm watching the fish, you know, swimming by. And as he got to the right position, I hit the shutter, the flash went off. Um, maybe surprised one or two fish, but probably not as much as the guy who owned the pet store. <laughs> but we don't have long, I can't tell all the stories. And so, um, so this is a few of the images from that. 
And I kind of laugh at it because in each one of the cases, there are many different things that are kind of going on in terms of what I'm trying to show, but also the things that are, um, that what it kind of takes to kind of do some of the images as well. And so um, for this, I've really kind of been playing with um, both um, the constructions of the images, but also that sense of time, the different codes, the different kind of symbols and things on the street. Now, although these two images are not next to one another in the book, I want you to notice this one. This is my aunt, who is um, more like my grandmother. My aunt Ruth, she's now deceased. But um, sometimes I would show this image with another image of my uncle. And sometimes, although they're not in the book, they'd end up going out together. So let me pull, I'm sorry. Let me pull back to this image here. And so the thing that was kind of um, interesting and sort of another kind of dynamic is that she was very light-skinned. He was very dark-skinned. And that created problems for them both inside and outside the black community. Um, as a black and white photographer, it's also interesting in terms of the positive and negative element of the images as well. But, um, so I would send these out periodically, and her pattern actually comes from the, um, the burglar bars on the back window to keep somebody from breaking in. His pattern actually comes from the, um, sorry, comes from um, the stripes coming in through the blinds, and he's in front of the refrigerator. And as I would send these out together, there was one day when I just sat down, and I looked at the two of them side, side by side, and I was just really startled. Well, I ran track, and ran track competitively. I ran sprints and hurdles. And one thing is, if you do your workouts, if you do your preparation, you'll find that when you step into the blocks, you're hoping for that magical day when you sort of, what some people call going into a zone, where you actually run beyond the point of where it's, where it's, you know, where it's physical and mental, and it almost comes out on sort of a spiritual level. And I've also learned to kind of transfer much of that in terms of how I work as an artist and a photographer. And I looked at these two images side by side, and I was startled because I realized something even more significant with it. That is, that my aunt and her friends would always do things in terms of knitting, crocheting, etc., and wasn't even thinking about that when I created this piece or when I saw it. Now, my uncle, on the other hand, was a little different, and he has the stripes going across his head. And my uncle grew up in Mississippi, and he did auto body work, and he was not only very good at blending and matching colors, but his specialty was actually hand striping cars in the days before striping tape. And that's how he was able to make money at an accelerated level, was able to purchase and, have, and you know, create his own, uh, his own garage in Champaign. So there are many times when you know, I do the work, look at it later, live with it, and start to recognize things in it that I hadn't necessarily intended or recognized or realized. And so, so it's wonderful for me to kind of have the experiences of, and what I've you know, said to many people before is that the, the experiences for me are primary. And that's the most important thing. So I'm not one of the photographers who will do anything to get the photograph. I try to be very respectful. I talk with people. There's a longer story in terms of how I interact with folks. I highly recommend any of you that are photographers in the, in the, in the audience. And when you go out and photograph, um, do a couple of things. But one of them is take work with you. So people can kind of see what you're doing, why you're doing it. You can kind of put that into context. And it makes a huge difference. Um, and also be respectful you know, of people as well, too. And think about if you were doing what they're getting ready to do, or in the process of, would you want to be photographed? The other thing is, once you step into somebody's place to photograph them, you've then trespassed. And so you really kind of owe it to them to explain what you're doing, why, et cetera. And so, um, and Bill Jay, a photo historian, an old friend, he's now deceased, but he said something years ago that has always stuck with me. And he said, always leave a photographic situation so that it will be as easy, if not easier, for another photographer to follow in your footsteps. And so that's something I try to live by, both in terms of as I'm photographing, but also in many ways in terms of how I travel. Now, this is the Black Transatlantic Experience. And um, this was kind of interesting for me because um, I ended up photographing around Chicago and was working on a larger project. But I was very fortunate to receive a couple of, um, a couple of grants, but it was also at a point in time when my mother was dying. And so I started looking at not only just photographing around Chicago and the US, but starting to make some different trips. Now, in the book, for those who are taking a look, you'll find that the four countries, in terms of Ghana, Jamaica, England, and the US, are intermingled. So you actually have to go to the bottom of the page to see which country you're actually in. But for this presentation, I'm going to have the images separate. So right now, you're actually looking at a Black Club Party talent contest in Chicago, not too far away from where I grew up. You also, if you're going to be a photographer, have to be very aware of what happens with light. And magical things happen. So right now, you're looking at you know, if you had an overcast day, there is no photograph here. So where is the little girl that's holding her mother's hand? What about the lady going in the opposite direction carrying the bag? Much less the fact that the guy doesn't even match up with his own shadow. So, you know, look at this sort of that shadowed projection. And that's my godfather over on your left. And 
On the right is Rubian's mother, Anadrina. And that's actually at my dad's house as they're playing bridge. And this one um, um, is actually on 57th Street, Street Beach in Chicago. And I try to back off on the stories, but I need to tell you this one. I was working on a project called Change in Chicago. It was the last day of a one-year project. I was one of 33 photographers photographing a 600 Chicago area for one year. So it's the last day of the project. It's the last roll of film. It's in the evening. And I shot the last frame. So I'm like, all right, that's it. I'm going home. And I started to advance the camera. And my thumb kept going, and it kept going, and it kept going, and it kept going, and I heard a click. I went, oh, no, I've got one more frame. And I didn't want to waste the frame, so I'm looking around going, okay, this is the last one, what can I do? So I looked around, and I see this guy down on the beach, and he throws his baby in the air, and he catches him. And I just let him, said, that's it, that's it, I've got to get him. So I stood there, and the guy's walking down the beach, and he looks like he's going to jostle the baby again. And he goes further and further, he looks like he's going to throw him again. And so I just said, okay, first of all, it's a manual camera, fortunately. So I'm able to meet at the ground, know where my little imaginary X is. I'm able to take into account the lighting, because if I, may, if I aim and I get that sky, I'm going to have an underexposed baby for those photographers in the group, right? Okay. So I get everything all ready. So I have the f-stop, the shutter speed, I have the focus set, and I'm waiting, and I, there's this imaginary X in the sand. I'm waiting for this guy to hit that spot and toss the baby. He's, he's moving. He's carrying him. He gets to that spot. He looks like he's getting ready to throw the baby, and he starts to take one more step. <laughs> I pulled the camera down and I said, wait a minute, man. I said, you're not going to throw the baby? <laughs> he goes, no, I'm not going to throw the baby. Why? You're going to take a picture? You're going to take a picture? I'm going to throw I'll throw the baby. I said, of course I'm going to take a baby. goes straight up in the air. I follow him up, hit the shutter, immediately try to advance, no film. Hit the rewind knob, started to rewind as quickly as possible, turn it to the guy, and he was gone. That was it. Huh. I've never seen the guy again or the baby. And so, um, so a couple of things that are interesting in that it's been couple different book covers, it's been a couple of different books, it's been posted, it's been several exhibitions, and I waited for a long time for somebody to come up and tell me that they were the dad. And then I realized enough time has now passed that I should be waiting for somebody about this tall coming up with a very deep voice saying, I'm the baby. <laughs> <laughs> now, since I work digitally, the problem is that people now accuse me of having done this digitally. And in my self-defense, I'd say, no, I didn't, because if I did, you would not see my shadow and the shadow of my camera strap hanging down there. <laughs> or would you? <laughs> okay. Now, Jamaica. I know the part of my family is from Jamaica, but I have no idea what part of Jamaica or if anyone still lives there. But when I first made the first trip to Jamaica, I very, very quickly realized that my family did not come from the tourist resorts, especially at the Holiday Inn, that they had the armed guards and automatic <laughs> weapons guarding the beach. And so I started walking around into the communities, talking with people. And what I did was, um, for a couple of trips, I carried slides so I could you know, pass slides around, take them in place, pull them to the light. I do not promise to give people photographs. That's one of the things where you're going to really make it messy for yourself and other photographers. So I show work, I try to share work, I do give people work back sometimes, but I never promise to do it because I may not be able to follow through on that. And so um, what I found is that um, I showed work, talked to folks, and just walked all around the community. And by the way, every time I hit this image, and I just had did it right now, I was a little startled because I went, uh-oh, I blew it. I have an image out of place. This is from Ghana. This is not. This is from Jamaica. So I've seen kids walking the dog together. I've seen it in different countries. But there's only time I've seen two guys walking the dog together. And yes, this one is in Jamaica. Okay. And this one is actually, um, this is a wonderful experience. This is in the harbor in Kingston. And so um, this guy was uh, diving off the rocks. And I saw this haircut, and I just thought it was wonderful. And um, on a later trip, what I did was I took an SX-70 Polaroid, and I would give away Polaroids to folks. And that way I could promise, because I'm giving it over immediately. So I see this guy diving off the rocks, this really incredible haircut. So I asked him, walked over and said, look, can I take a photograph of your haircut? It's amazing. And he goes, sure. And I said, besides, it's not for me, it's for you anyway. And he said, okay, cool. So I take the first photograph of him, I pull it out, I hand him the SX-70 Polaroid, and I give it to him too quickly because the image hadn't come up yet. So I'm watching the image come up, come up, come up, and it doesn't look good. He's looking at me, he's smiling, he's nodding, yes, and I'm looking at him, shaking my head, no, he goes, what's wrong? I said, I'm sorry, man, I didn't do your head justice. I said, the angle of the, you know, the angle of the sun, the shadow is not, is cutting off part of the, part of your haircut. I want to do it again, because I like this image. I said, you can have that image, and you can have the next one, too. Let me do it again. I can do a better job. He says, what do you need me to do? I said, I need you to tilt your head forward just a little bit. He said, like this? I said, uh, a little bit more. His friend looked over and said, oh, I see what you mean. Grab his head, torch it like a basketball. <laughs> so I hit the shutter, pull that one out, and as you can imagine, I was excited. When you get excited, I kind of talk fast. And I think what I said was something to the effect about, hope oh, you don't mind having another camera in my pocket, you might take a photograph of it. And I said, okay. And I took two other frames of my 35 millimeter in my pocket, and this is what you were seeing here. Okay? Uh -huh. Now, Ghana, 
Um, one thing that's amazing is Chicago has such a large Ghanaian community that they have a huge Ghana Fest there every summer. And I know many of the Ghanaians. In fact, several of my friends have been going back and forth to Ghana. So when I went, I went to um, visit um, to see the family and friends of one of my buddies who had come from Ghana but had not been home in over 15 years and did not go with me either. So I had to go and be sort of the messenger to see his mother and explain why he wasn't coming back and why, had, why he hadn't been back. His, um, his uh, sister, his namesake, nephew had never met before. Um, I met two of his grammar school classmates um, and his first cousin who he was very, very close to. And once again, unfortunately I didn't have the time to tell all the stories on that, but it was a very, very warm and incredible experience. Now as I'm going through this also, I'm sort of looking at these countries and also as you look at the work here, one thing I need to be candid can with you about and that is that when you see a body of work up, it looks like it's this completed body of work, it looks like it makes sense, it all fits together, but then that's a whole body of work with individual pieces. And the reality of it is, as an artist, I'm looking at the different ways to try to take some of these things that really mean something to me and create some kind of interpretation, some way to kind of pull it together. So I'm just sort of being candid with you about that. So I photographed in the U.S. first, looked at it and was kind of curious about going to Jamaica. Looked at it and said, okay, well now that I've been to Jamaica, I want to go to one of the countries in West Africa, uh, well in Africa, but especially, and specifically West Africa, that was heavily involved in the slave trade. Looking at one of the British colonies, at least so that would be one of the languages. Well, also if you were in Accra, you may find that they may speak English, but also you'll find Hausa, Fanti, Twi, Ashanti, Gong, etc. And so it's pretty amazing. Um, the good part is, is that I had friends from Ghana who had lived in Chicago, and one of them had moved back, and it was a soccer star by the name of Seaboy. So between Seaboy's cousin, Big Mo, it was an unbelievable time period. So what you're actually looking at is the, and so actually the reason what, where, where, what's happening at this point is, I mentioned Big Mo and Seaboy. Well, Big Mo's sister had moved to Kamasi from Accra, and he had been out of touch with her for about five years. So we were going through the marketplace trying to find his sister. No telephone, it's by word of mouth. So while we're trying to find his sister, that's when I run across this incredible scene in terms of the braided hair. And make a note of this image, you will see this image later. Okay? And here you have a game called Five Five with the men of Adaraka playing a neighboring community. So I walked up at our normal sort of meeting place in the neighborhood. And by the way, the guy with his arms folded, that's one of Big Mo's cousins. And on the end, what you have is on one side, the men of Adaraka, and on the other side, the men of a neighboring community as they're playing this card game. And if I remember correctly, this is about eight to nine o'clock in the morning. And so not only is the, is the score being kept on the table, but there's a board propped up on a tree, which, which is in another image, saying us and them. So everybody <laughs> going to work is watching what's happening with this neighborhood card game. Okay, now we move on to England. And since I had been to, you know, to Jamaica and to Ghana and in the US, I was looking at also completing the British colonial slave trade route on a contemporary level. And the other thing is, is that, of course, these are all places where I could have found myself, depending upon which relative ended up on which ship. And so, um, so I went to England, and uh, of course, um, some of the things that I looked at were, you know, knowing about the um, Jamaican and Trinidadian communities that came over as a cheap labor force following World War II, but also, especially when you go over to Liverpool, Bristol, et cetera, you'll find families that have been over there for generations that came over connected to the slave trade. And so also, um, as I'm looking at things, also do look at little plays, like the black woman being free here, but the sale with the, with the white mannequin sort of on the auction block in the window. Was that Brixton? Yes, yes it was. I actually lived in Brixton, and also I went over to um, Birmingham, um, and over to Liverpool in the Toxteth area. Um, I was there for the Notting Hill Carnival, and actually that year I photographed the Oval Lions, who actually won the best costume that year. But yeah, but I wanted to live in bricks. And actually, it's funny you ask that, answer that question because it leads right into here. And I love it when you kind of follow up too. So, thank you. Actually, who you have is Stefford on the recorder. Um, um, I'm sorry, Barry's on the recorder. Stefford is on the bongos. And I want you to notice the time here because it's 2.35 in the morning. And I forgot whether or not they ran out of cigarettes or whether or not it was beer. However, the Bobbies were patrolling Brixton that night. If any one of them had gone out, we would have to go out and bail them out of jail. So I was the one, all right, I can't play musical instrument either. But, and by the way, over to the left, there are a whole bunch of other musicians playing. And so I was the one that had to go to the aftermarket store. And the reason for that is, is that I did not have dreadlocks. I did not have a West Indian accent. I had a US passport. 
So I was more free in their community than they were, which was the reversal, of course, in terms of what it was like for me growing up on the south side of Chicago with some of the dynamics there. Okay, now over to your left is the same hair braiding. You're now looking at the Soul Searching series. The pattern in the background is actually suminagashi, floating ink on water with like a detergent, or you know, like a suds to kind of float it. And as you create that pattern, you take something like a rice paper, lower it down so that you pick up that ink in that pattern, flip it over and let it dry. That was then thrown on the scanner and through multiple repetitions, that's how that pattern was then stair-stepped and made to go across. Now I'm in many of the images as well, so I'm just gonna go through a few of these. They were black and white, and there are a couple of these in the collection here. And what you're looking at is the viaduct in Chicago, but you're looking at the slave castle, you know, slave castles in Ghana. Um, the little figure that's over to the right is actually what is referred to as a Zulu stirring rod. It's a cocktail stirring rod. They also made little um, hors d'oeuvre um, toothpicks as well. And, um, but some of them actually have numbers on them as well. So what you have is the, the gravitational effects of, of what is both very racist and sexist in terms of the gravitational changes as these figures are aging, sort of in this little progression. And some of the photographs, like over to the, um, over here, are from my Aunt Ruth's um, photo album. And what I found is that um, if I tried to show, well, anybody who says they're a photographer, everybody pulls out their picture album for them, the family album. So I also looked at that in terms of being a little self-conscious about that. So I was looking at ways to try to take that imagery and kind of do something with it to make it more interesting. But at the same time, I found out a lot more about my family as I would show the album and kind of go through the images. So the family would start to talk about something, then they would freeze up, turn the page, and hear a little bit more. So as I kind of showed the images over and over again and started coming back with these, I was able to piece together more of the stories about my family from the different, you know, from the different times of actually viewing. Um, the little baby that's up there is actually a senior at UT Austin, getting ready to graduate right now. And those are my parents on the bottom there. And so this piece that you saw earlier. And then I started working with um, colorizing them and actually working in color. So you actually have a three-dimensional program where the images are sort of texture mapped in the pieces as well. So I'm just going to kind of move through these just so you get a sense of seeing them. And, um, all right, I've got to tell you this story. That is me. New here, as well as what you see down here. If you look very carefully, you'll see that it's sort of blue and purple down there. And what those are are two antique car bumpers that are colorized. Not that I expect you to see that. But the other thing that skin tone is actually my body being reproduced over and over again. And I was in the backyard trying to do a handstand on the cherry tree stump in my backyard. And I do have one where I'm actually completely vertical and everything is good. However, one time the shutter went off when I was either on my way up or on my way down. So I took that, flipped that, rotated, made a pattern from that. The other thing I should tell you is that it's not, a good, it's not a good thing to actually photograph like that in your own backyard, your neighborhood, because I'm outside working on this and something, there's no alley. Now the buddy was a cartoonist right behind me, another friend, so somebody in the neighborhood sees the flash going off, and they holler, hey, what's going on out there? And then from another window, somebody yelled, it's Steve. He's taking photographs again. And I said, if he's taking photographs, let's go watch. And I'm yelling, no. I yelled the wrong thing. I know, no, I'm doing nude. Stay at home. Everybody came out there. So, <laughs> so my advice is, if you're just doing them, just kind of play it off a little bit. All right. So there's just a few more of those. I do jokingly tell people that is me as a baby, and that is, but I, you know, I can still do that, kind of crawl in one place and come out the other when I need to. <laughs> and there's a longer story to this one also, but a couple of the jokes about this have to do with the gecko lizard that um, was unfortunately killed when my wife and I moved into Arizona. Um, we had an argument and debate over who actually killed the lizard, but while we were debating over it, the lizard was flipped, popped on the scanner, scanned and put into the piece. <laughs> I'm the person with the microphone, I'm telling the story, I'm gonna tell you point blank, my wife stepped on the lizard. Okay? And although you'll never recognize, and this is actually my friend Ira, so that's not his body, but that is his head. And, um, and snakes in the background. And uh, this is the last one of this series I'm gonna show you, and then I'm gonna move on, but this was a very, very significant image for me in a couple ways. For one, I used the rapid prototyping facility at Arizona State University in order to scan my favorite wishbone in a three-dimensional rotational scanner. That was then made as a wire form, and that's when I created the two figures carrying that other one wishbone off that's wounded or injured back there. And I was actually going to try to make a little fabricated sculpture that was three-dimensional that actually had that figure carrying it away. However, it was a little complex, and they had a few problems with the, um, with the fabricator, so that never happened. 
However, I then dropped it into Bryce and started to make this other figure, this other, this landscape with it, um, or sort of landscape, but also with the two wishbones where their shadows actually make the little anthropomorphic figure. I also turned that into an anaglyph, so you can see it with the red and green filters, you, I mean the, uh, yeah, the red and green filters, you actually see it go back three-dimensionally. But I also then made this piece, brought it back into Photoshop, and created the piece. And I had a problem. The problem was the upper left-hand corner. I did not know what to do with it. I tried a bunch of different things. It didn't work. I, put, I hit save as, put this piece away for a while, and then finally came, you know, trying to figure out what to do with it. Couldn't figure out anything. So I went out by the pool one day in Arizona. By the way, I'm a Midwestern in Arizona. A pool is not luxurious. It's self-defense. Fourth day we moved out there, it was 118 degrees. Okay? Thought we'd made a mistake. So anyway, I'm out by the pool, and up comes this praying mantis. And I looked at him and said, oh no, this is it. I've got to do it. And I ran in the house, grabbed, grabbed my little C2000 digital camera, ran back out, did several photographs of him while he moved around, attacked the camera, and then flew off. Ran back in the house, downloaded the images, ran through, picked one, put it in that space, sized it, started cleaning up around it. My wife walked in, looked at the monitor and said, yeah, now that works in that section. Well, the thing for me that was a real turning point is that was the, here I am looking at actually dropping an element in a piece that I just saw. I'm inside 15 minutes. I couldn't even dry film that fast. You can't even send color film to a one hour lab in time. I had to wait another 45 minutes. So that immediacy of being able to work with a digital camera was so significant that it really started to change the way I was working and that's when I started looking more at using that tool as a major tool as opposed to, as opposed to film. Okay, so I'm gonna pull out of there and um, I'm going to probably hit some of the things in terms of uh, the Underground Railroad. And once again, you have, you can ask questions, and as you know, like I said, many, many stories to tell you as well. All right? So, here I am getting ready to go to Buffalo. You already saw the Soul Searching series. They had that work on the wall. The director called me on the phone and said, look, we'd like you to come out here and do a lecture, same way I'm doing now. And um, he said, well, you know, we'll figure out an honorarium and everything for you. We'll feed you. How is you okay? I said, fine. So I hang up the phone, he calls you back about five minutes later, and he's laughing, going, wait a minute, I'm the director now, I used to be the assistant director. Because we have a dark room set up, we have a digital lab set up, we have, um, you know, we've already worked with you before on some other projects, and he said, we're starting a residency program next summer. He said, however, we're bringing you in anyway, we've worked with you before, would you consider being a guinea pig? I said, keep talking. He goes, um, when you come out here, can you stay with us for a couple of weeks? I said, absolutely. I said, what do you want me to photograph? He goes, I don't know. Just um, come out, find out what you uh, experience in the community, share that with us so we can you know, start to um, talk with, um, give some information to the upcoming residents you know, about what's happening in the community. I said, absolutely. I said, if there's any, since there isn't anything in particular you really want me to photograph here, there is one thing that I am very curious about. I want to find out more about. He says, what's that? I said, no, that Detroit and Buffalo are the two major crossing sites for the Underground Railroad going into Canada. He said, got you covered. We have some people to introduce you to. That was an understatement. Um, I went in those two weeks. I ended up meeting some of Harriet Tubbins' relatives. I was there for a Broderick Park dedication ceremony. I met um, Sandra Olson, who was the curator at Niagara University, later at the University of Buffalo, who um, had done an underground railroad project on seven stations underground railroad there. She then um, shared many books with me, talked to me about it, made connections for me to get in and out of sites, and is actually the person that packaged and put together the exhibition that's now traveling, that you see here. Um, what I thought was going to be two weeks ended up turning into nine years. Took me to over 24 different states where I photographed one or more sites. Another approximately 10 sites where, I mean, 10 states where I photographed um, slave quarters, terminus points, and gained access to different kind of documents and artifacts. Now this piece is actually up and on the wall over there, and what you actually have is about seven different newspapers where nothing is typed, everything is photographed and stitched together. Nothing of, uh, nothing of it is typed. So even the lands and Negroes is the classified section column for one of the newspapers. And what you have is several different ads that all deal with slavery. And so I'm just gonna kind of run through some of these real quickly. You can kind of see where this is a cotton plantation that comes with um, two cotton plantations with 200 Negroes for sale. The reward for um, servant girl Ellen who ran away January 1st, she is a light a very light mulatto with long straight black hair, about 25 years old and well known around town. Um, in this case, you have a $20, $20 award for a guy who has uh, the fourth finger on his left hand is off of the second joint. He has also lost nearly all of his front teeth. He's about 30 years of age. So you find these incredible things in terms of some of the descriptions and obviously we can look at some of the things that have happened to the folks in conjunction with that. Slave Depot in New Orleans. Um, and this is one of the ads where I actually came home 
And uh, one of the jokes around the house is that um, I'm not supposed to come home with another newspaper. I could probably get by if it was the one for that day. But other than that, I'm not supposed to come in with another newspaper. So I came home from a trip one time, and my wife said, okay. So what do you have? I said, okay, I've got a few different things. But I only bought one newspaper. She goes, not another newspaper. I said, yes. Yeah. She goes, what is so special about this paper? I said, oh, it has a little section in it. It's really interesting called, you know, Cash for Negroes. She goes, no. You already have some papers that have Cash for Negroes. What's so special about this one? I said, no, let me show you. And I laid it out. And you'll see it in the piece over here. But what was stunning was that there were three different ads in there for Cash for Negroes. One of them where they were looking for 300 people, one looking for 400 people, and then this one looking for 500 people. And it was where they were looking at this mass grouping of folks here on the East Coast. They were then gonna be shipped off to either march across land or shipped to states in the Deep South, like Mississippi, Louisiana, et cetera. And when she saw those three numbers on that same page, then she knew automatically why, you know, why I purchased that particular paper. Also, this is insurance on Negroes. And this was a company, if I remember correctly, at least the newspaper actually came out of Kentucky. Okay, so this is just kind of give you some an idea, some, an idea of that. So what I also started doing was two things. After photographing all the different sites, it took me a while to kind of figure out some kind of a formula for how I was going to try to put together and tell the story. Although I photographed a lot of different places, I really kind of sat on and kind of worked with the images in a couple of different ways for about two years before I locked in on this one by four and a half ratio for the actual Underground Railroad sites. But also I felt that if I was going to go from one site to another site to another site, although they had different stories, it didn't tell the whole story and it's also going to lose you as an audience in terms of connecting with them. And so I started creating the montages that would, take to, that would, that would work together not only Underground Railroad sites, but also the terminus points, slave quarters, different documents and artifacts that I was running across that told the bigger picture of slavery because of course, that's what people were running from. And I wanted to try to figure out a way to really pull more of this material together. So I started working with um, material from some of the different documents and archives. So right now, you're looking at a scene that is in Natchez, Mississippi, under the hill. But if anybody knows that area, you can see that it doesn't quite look right because it actually has a section of the Ohio River that is now spliced over and covering over that section of the under the hill area. You also have newspapers um, in here uh, of runaways and you all, the illustrations actually come from a $100 Confederate bill as well as a um, South Carolina banknote. The image that is on the right that says, can a mother forget her suckling child is actually courtesy of the Enoch Pratt Library Special Collection here. It is from the um, Henry Bibbs um, slave narrative. Um, the image on the left is actually a um, slave couple in Africa from a Harper's. And um, the woman was actually um, walking down the street in, uh, in Manhattan. Um, and that is actually braided hair that is across her back. Um, but that braided hair also in the, in the strap of her purse kind of take a, another kind of a switch and a connection. So what is the leather that is now going across her back is her purse strap. And in, instead of the, the whip scars, it's now that braided hair pattern. Now, we hit this place, and I need to tell you that an underground station did not have to be what some people refer to as a tricked out house. It didn't have to have a special hideaway, an attic, or a cellar where somebody was hidden. In fact, there's some underground sites, like um, there's a cemetery in, northern, uh, in the northern suburbs of Chicago um, that you read about in Glenetta Lee Turner's book on the Underground Railroad that is actually a cemetery that was just a meeting place. So one of the things that gets overplayed are the tunnels and, and the other things. Another thing is that many people talk about the Underground Railroad, and when you really hear most about it and think about that movement to Canada, that is really in conjunction with and following the 1850s Fugitive Slave Act, which forced Northerners to help return slaves to the South. So before that, what you're actually looking at is people going in any direction to try to get freedom, whether or not it was by themselves, getting help along the way. Some of the things that get played down with the Underground Railroad is how much the neighboring plantation was the first stop that somebody went to because that's where their family and their friends were. They could also blend in with that community. Also, as they started to move through different free black communities throughout the country, that often gets played down as well. Um, you hear a lot about the Quakers, and they were very instrumental involved in it. You're gonna find other different groups as well that are involved in it. So I'm not taking anything away from it, sort of looking at, just point, kind of pointing out the level of complexity, you know, with this as well. 
So that if you went to Canada too early on, you were going to be highly disappointed because you're going to be standing there next to some other folks who were Canadian slaves. Okay? So depending upon what time period, depending upon what direction and what location would be the spot to get to freedom. Now that I've told you about the time thing overplayed and everything, now I'm going to be guilty of showing you one of the most exotic underground railroad sites I ever ran into in my life. And this is the Old Tavern up in Unionville, Ohio. It is due west of Ashtabula. And um, I'm going to break this piece down to show you. And so this is the full piece here. And what you have is the fact that this is a stagecoach inn that has a highway out front. It was also known for having four very small bedrooms upstairs on the second floor that you could only access off of a very, very narrow stairway in the kitchen. I've been there several times. I know how narrow it is. I know how low the, you know, how low the overhang is. The ceiling, you know, it's not quite the overhang. And still, I bump my head every time I go through there. And so, um, but because there's so many other stairways and so many windows, nobody misses those four bedrooms. Now, I also want you to notice that there is a highway out front because this place was known for having a tunnel <coughs> that went underneath the street, kitty corner, to a false grave in the cemetery across the street. So at any rate, what you have here is the door next to the one that went upstairs to the four bedrooms is the one that goes downstairs to where that tunnel is. This is already down in the basement, but showing you that same doorway. This is looking into the tunnel about as far as you can go because the tunnel, uh, you notice there was a highway. And so because of that, the tunnel has been filled in so that it will not collapse under, especially the weight of 18 wheelers. And many times when people found the tunnels and things in their yard, it was often when they were mowing the lawn and um, sort of went through the ground. And, um, and sometimes those places were being torn down. So you actually look about as far as you can go here. This is about as far as you can be in the tunnel looking back at the stairway where you're just before. This is in the image just before. Now, from here, Hubbard House historian Debbie Levesque, and by the way, I should say something else too though, and that is, I owe a great deal of thanks to many of the grassroots and local historians, collectors, archivists, et cetera, who've been extremely gracious in terms of sharing information and their stories with me. Um, without that, I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't be able to do this work. Um, I'm also, you know, I'm very grateful to them in, in many ways, and I just want to kind of say that. So at this point, I'm actually you know, being taken through this house with Debbie Levesque, by the way, this place is a great place to go for brunch, and um, it was um, really kind of interesting in terms of trying to figure out how to photograph while coffee was being fixed and everything else. But then Debbie LeBeck then takes me across the street to the cemetery, and she says, okay, here's the cemetery. I said, fantastic. I said, where's the false grave? She says, we don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? I said, well, we don't know. I said, I, she said, we just left the place. You saw that it's been filled in, it's been barricaded. And it was barricaded and filled in so long ago, nobody remembers which one is the false grave. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, Debbie, come on. Where is it? Come on, tell me. She goes, no, no, I'm serious. We really don't know. And I'm looking dead at her, you know, looking her in the eye. And I'm looking at her, and, and her face is, you know, she's giving a straight face and go, you're serious? She goes, yes, I'm serious. I said, uh-oh. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm a photographer. I may have been born in Illinois, but I think there's this little part of me that I think is from Missouri, because Missouri is a show-me state, and, uh, and I want to see it. Another thing is, you know, it's great if a historian tells you the story, but I'm a photographer. I've got to show you. And so I said, okay, now what do you know about it? She says, we know it's a little flat stone that would be pushed up, slid out of place, slid back, dropped back, back in place like an attic portal. I said, okay, cool. So I started looking around and asked her to tell me the story again. I'm asking her over and over again because, you know, people tell you a story. They tell you part of it but they may leave out a little detail. So I'm asking her again and again, I'm hoping there's another little piece, another little detail. There isn't one. And so Debbie said, look, I've been out here six or seven times with other people who've never been able to find. I said, that's okay, I like puzzles. Tell me the story again. And so I'm wearing her out. So finally she said, okay, Stephen, now are you ready for me to take you to another place? And I said, no. She said, why not now? I said, because I found it. She says, you what? I said, I found it. She goes, where? So I pointed this tombstone right here. She said, look, I told you, a little flat tombstone, that tombstone's over six feet tall, nobody can move it over and move it back. I said, yeah. Who looked down? She looked down, she looked up and gasped. And she goes, oh no, I know who's buried there. I said, you knew him? He said, no, no, I didn't know him. I know who's buried there. And I said, who is it? He said, it's Reverend Brunel, who was an abolitionist underground conductor who ran the station. So if this is the intersection here, an intersection here, and the stagecoach in is here, this tombstone is like right here. So the tombstone's here, tombstone's here, the church is here, more tombstones here, and now the cemetery goes back several blocks, just to give you an idea. So 
what I did was I knew the angle that the tunnel went at, so I'm just looking and searching around at that angle to kind of see what's there. And so this is it. Now, he died in 1884. Okay? Now, that's now 24 years after, you know, that's, you know, we're looking at two decades after the Civil War, round it off. And so the tunnel was obsolete at that point. And some of you are looking going, wait a minute, he made a mistake. That's 1894. Well, some things you need to know about photography. Some things are not the way they appear. That actually is an eight, not a nine. And I've not only gone back, but I've actually traced my finger through there. So, so it is 1884. And so, um, so the thing is, the tunnel had been obsolete for, you know, rounded off to two decades by that point. So what happened is, is that Reverend Brunel and his wife are buried on the other end of the tunnel. Now, what I want you to notice is this little tab. See the little thing right there? Okay. That's it. So you can actually see what it says, memory of myths. So that is the Falls tombstone. Their tombstone is set up on top of it. Now, I wish I had known this because I would have jumped on the plane and gone back out there. But Debbie Levesque got permission to go back out and remove that top <coughs> tombstone. So she told me the ladies, the fictitious ladies, name and birth and death date, that all checked out. They then did a four-foot probe around there, but they also found that there was, um, it was inconclusive. She and I both agree it's about 8 to 15 feet down, so they wouldn't have found it anyway. And so we may wonder, well, why don't they dig it up? Why don't they try to figure that out? Well, when Wilbur Sieber did his book on the Underground Railroad, and I believe that was 1898, he identified over 600 Underground Railroad sites in just the state of Ohio. Okay? So unfortunately, many of these places are unknown. Some of them are destroyed. Sometimes developers get rid of them because they're sending away some of their projects. And um, in fact, I'm going to show you home of John Rankin. And actually, in Siebert's book, he's not even mentioned as one of the underground conductors for that county. Okay? And then that is the piece. Okay? So each one of the pieces up here, there's sort of a method to the madness in terms of the narrative, in terms of how the place has been historically used, the story behind it, sometimes how it, you know, how it fits in is used on a contemporary level, all kind of woven together. Now, I'm going to go through just a couple of the other images, and also um, some things were wonderful. I mean, what you're looking at is over 30 trips, some of them longer, some of them shorter. And when I travel, I travel very hard and rough. Um, I was telling uh, one of the groups earlier today what it was like for me on one of my trips, and so um, I'm actually, actually pretty surprised that Hertz will still rent me a car, considering um, what has happened. Um, I always bring them back, but um, I'll tell you, I'll come back to the trips later, and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Now, this is Evergreen Plantation in Louisiana, the River Road area. This plantation still has 22 slave quarter cabins still in existence, 11 on each side of the road. And so that's what you're actually seeing. You're seeing one side of the road, and then I'm sitting on one of the porches, and you're seeing the concentric porches continuing to go back in the space there. There's actually another place where there are about 34 cabins that still exist there. Um, so in, in Louisiana, there was a place where I found more sort of existing cabins like the Society like Quarters than any other state. Uh, other places I found, you know, a few cabins here, a few cabins there, but um, Louisiana was, was incredible for that. Now, we get to the home of John Rankin. And John Rankin um, is probably one of the best known underground conductors in the country. For those of you who have ever read Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, Eliza in Uncle Tom's Cabin was not a, fiction, a, Harry, a fictional Harry Beecher Stowe you know, character, she was real. And this is the house in the book that she really went to. So for those who have not read the story, what happened is um, Eliza's owner was in debt. And she had a young son. And the guy who came to collect money on that debt, as he was coming in the house, saw Eliza's young son and was very enchanted with him and was forcing the owner to make to purchase in exchange of that child part of settling that debt. The owner didn't want to do it, the guy, but he owed the guy money and he was forcing the issue as a, as a debt collector. Now Eliza overheard the story and she just, and for, you know, she, of course she was, she was startled, stunned, and um, grabbed her young son and ran away. And unfortunately what happened is the posse of course went after her and they caught up with her. And when they caught up with her, it was over here. So you're looking at Ohio, the Ohio River, and Kentucky. So over on the shore here, the posse's closing in on her, and she sees the posse behind her, and she sees the water in front of her. So 
She decided that she and her son would not, you know, her son was going to be raised in slavery. She was not going back. And it was wintertime. And there were ice blocks floating on the Ohio River. And so she jumped onto one of the blocks with her son from that block to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, until she made it across. The posse just looked and shook their head. They weren't even going to try this. And she got across, and there was a slave catcher on the other side who was watching the whole thing. And he just looked at her and said, if you can do that, I can't turn you in. I have to help you. And he then directed her to Rankin's house. Mm -hmm. So Rankin is the, is the house that has the beacon that can be seen for miles up and down the Ohio River. It also has what you see going down the hillside. And it goes all the way through the woods and comes out on 4th Street in town is what is known as Freedom Stairway. Now, what I want you to think about, and I'm going to get to it in a minute, is right down in here, I'm going to show you the other house. But next image should be a little bit more of Freedom Stairway as it comes down from the house, going down through the woods. Okay? Now, right on the edge of the river is this house. This is the home of John Parker, black underground conductor who actually, I believe, owned three patents. He has a foundry that's only only a couple, only about a block and a half away from his house. Now, there's a book called His Promised Land, which is how I know the story, and only because I know the story was I able to get into this house, okay, at the time. Now, according to the story, what happened is Parker would actually talk people into running away because of Red Oak. So he went upstairs, warmed up by the fireplace, started planning how they were going to get to the next place. All of a sudden, you know what happened. It's banging on the door, it's a posse. They come in, they storm the house, they search it from top to bottom, but they left empty-handed. So Parker went back upstairs, not knowing whether or not his guests may have possibly jumped out of the second floor window or not, but it turned out that the two guys had actually found a ladder, climbed up to the raw rafters, pulled the ladder up behind them, and no one looked up. So that's why this piece from 01 features the rafters over and over again. Now, I went back and photographed it again in 04, and this is what it looks like. And unfortunately, the rafters are covered over. And I was startled. I said, wait a minute, hold it. What happened? And it turns out that they were doing everything they could to save the house because there was a major leak in the roof. And as they were trying to fix the place, they forgot about that story and that narrative. So as I delivered the piece to them, we then started talking about what they could possibly do to cut through the ceiling, to go back to the rafters, remove the insulation, and put a light up there so that could at least be part of the, the future, you know, the future uh, you know, tours of the home. Um, you have the, the steps right here are made in his foundry. There's some of the farm equipment that also came from his foundry, just, uh, just you know, a block and a half away. But I also want to point out to you is on the top of the hill right here, the little indentation up there on the hill, that's Rankin's house. So you have the white underground conductor on the top of the hill, the black underground conductor on the river. The two of them not only work together, but you can see where their two houses had a direct sight line of each other as well. Okay? Now, these are actually brands. And these are brands of um, Phi, Beta Sigma, Fater Phi Beta Sigma fraternity. Um, the Sigmas are master branders as well as uh, the Qs. Um, and some people ask me about this image and why I included it. Well, I also see that there is a celebratory, involuntary, you know, celebration of the fraternity of the Sigmas and the Qs and many of the other, um, you know, predominantly black fraternities. Um, it's a point of fraternal pride. But I also see it as a, also, as a sort of revisiting of um, brands in terms of the branding of livestock and slaves as well, as there was African scarification, but in sort of a contemporary way of, of paternal celebration. Now I'm going to come back to this piece, and I'll try to show you all the images that were used for this and tell you more of the story on that. There's a split in this image, and um, there's several different images in here. You actually have part of the Todd House, part of the home of Henderson the Welling. You have um, the slave quarters of the Kingsley Plantation. The ocean is coming in in Cape May, New Jersey. So you have a few things here. But one thing I would like to ask you, and that is, how many people in the audience like cherries? Okay, a bunch of folks. Okay, good. Now, what you actually have here is the home of Henderson Llewellyn right here. You should be looking into his basement, but this is a montage, not about the individual underground railroad site. If you look in the book, you see what the house itself looks like. But this is actually the Todd house from Tabor, which is back over there. And this is also the basements where the rifles were held for the bleeding Kansas battles for John Brown. That's also the same rifles that were shipped over for Harper's Ferry as well. However, I did ask you about cherries, and that is the home of Henderson Llewellyn here. 
Well, it turns out, I found out, as I'm photographing the place, the lady said, by the way, if you ever end up in Northern California, we'd love it if you could go to his grave. So I've been out there before, but I was at the tour group, so we couldn't make a detour to go to the cemetery. So I was going up to Oakland, so I tried to uh, give her a call to find out what cemetery it was, and I couldn't reach it because it was seasonal, so I couldn't reach to get through on the number. So I then kind of remembered about where, what the name was, and it was a little off from what I remember, and I was able to track it down, and I called the cemetery and asked about his grave. And they said, well, when did he die? What year? And I said, well, I don't know. They said, well, we're, you know, but here's his name, and here's how it's spelled. They said, well, we can't tell you. They said, because we do our records according to death dates. So once again, I could not reach them. They were out for the season, so I figured, okay, I have nothing to lose. Let me just Google Henderson Llewellyn and see what I find. Maybe there's a death date there. And I Google it, and I can't believe what I'm looking at. Henderson Llewellyn was an underground conductor in South, um, southwestern Iowa. Uh, I'm sorry, southeastern Iowa. Um, his dad used to live in Indiana. They used to have orchards, and so when he left Iowa, he then traveled with, what, two to three hundred Cherokee stock routes on the back of a wagon out to Oregon, where he started, numer you know, we started a major orchard. He then moved to Northern California. So in Hayward, California, Llewellyn Street is named after him. He's known as the father of Pacific horror culture. And so here's this incredible, you know, you know later life of Henderson Llewellyn. And by the way, um, he named the Bing Cherry after one of his Chinese workers. Mm -hmm and he was one of the developers of the Lambert Cherry. Okay, so it's very funny how, I shouldn't say funny, but strange how these things kind of go all around. Um, this is the Michigan Street Church in Buffalo, New York. This is the home of um, Peter Mott in Longside, New Jersey, black underground conductor. And um, what you'll see is actually the house in the hideaway on the steps, but also this is the same house, but the entryway of what it looks like coming in through the woods to get to his door. The little shoe that's there is actually was found during the archaeological dig at the site. So I try to include many different things. This one is actually a split image where it is the grave of Harriet Tubman on the, on your right, mm -hmm. and on the left the grave of Frederick Douglass. Um, he was mm -hmm. um, buried in Rochester, New York. Harriet Tubman is in um, Auburn, New York. Um, this one is hanging up over there. This is the Sand Cave, and um, if you look in the book, I tell you it's in the Shawnee Forest in southern Illinois. But I can't tell you where it is because it is technically a protected site. Took a little bit before I actually was taken out there. What looks like one image right here is actually about nine images stitched together. And who you have right here is Park Ranger Marlene Rivera singing spirituals while I'm photographing, which is resounding through this cave and just was incredible. And then she stopped and said, okay, Stephen, you still taking pictures? I said, yes. I said, why am I so many pictures? I said, you'll see later. So I finished photographing and when I came back and delivered this piece to the park, she looked and she goes, now I know why you took so many photographs. And she grabbed her bag, she grabbed her coat and said, let's go. I said, where are we going? She said, well, I called my boss and told her you were coming back. So I've been given clearance to take you to some other places. And did. And took me to an archaeological dig site of a black community there as well. So folks were hidden in this cave. And there was another cave about a mile away called Cronau, where signal fires were set for the people, the signal people that were living here as well. This is actually the home of John Tun in, uh, in actually a Chicago suburb, which is an underground station. And um, it's a longer story with him, but as I, as I called and talked to one of the historians about John Tun and the site, and I explained what I was using in terms of this trade car for the piece, he said, well, wait a minute, Stephen. He goes, you do realize that um, Illinois is a little bit too far north for cotton to be growing. And I said, well, I do understand that. I said, but you'd be surprised how well it grows digitally. <laughs> <laughs> But I love this car in terms of, you know, so you'll see some of these, you'll see some of these cars and things later too. This is the Eleutherian College in Lancaster, Indiana. It's actually an integrated school. I think we're probably starting to run out of time a little bit, getting a little press, so I need to get, I'm gonna just move a little faster with some of these. Um, this is also on the wall, but this is the 1838 um, Am I Not a Woman and a Sister anti-slavery token. Um, now, this is moving on to Florida. So this is where Fort Mose was. And so this is outside of St. Augustine. You had folks that were settling in this area as early as 1687. And uh, circa 1720, you actually had this area charted. So folks who were, what were um, the Spanish were passing the message by word of mouth that the British slaves could escape and make it St. Augustine and take on the Catholic religion, they'd get their freedom. So what you're looking at is several different images here of, this, of what's left of the Shell Mountain Island. So this is walking out, and this is like several different images to give you a sense of just kind of what that area looked like. What you have here is Issa Ham Bryant, 
And this is the Lancaster Hanty River Battlefield site in Jupiter, Florida. It's where you had two major battles of January 15th and January 21st, I mean 24th of 1838. And what happened is the U.S. troops came in to remove the Seminoles. What they wanted to do was take who they considered to be the blood Seminoles and relocate them. Um, and they wanted to take the, who they referred to as the black Seminoles and take them back into slavery. Seminoles said there are no black and blood Seminoles. We're all one people and we're not moving. So in the first major battle, the Seminoles were outnumbered five to one, but it was their territory, their swamp, their turf, they won. The U.S. government mustered up more troops, came in, they were outnumbered seven to one, they actually fought to a stalemate. While they then sat in that stalemate waiting for some kind of um, upper level decision to be made, the U.S. troops broke that truce, captured the Seminoles, and then relocated them to, uh, to Oklahoma. So what you have is Catherine Ramirez or Hummingbird doing a smoking and smudging ceremony. It was, it was an incredible day. And unfortunately, he says one of the people who, um, is no longer with us now. This is a Cape Florida lighthouse, and so this is actually the area where the Seminoles were launching from this area to go to the Bahamas in both commercial ships as well as dugout canoes. When the U.S. government then took over the area and built the lighthouse, it stopped the use of this island as an underground station for about 10 years. Seminoles came back in, took over the place, smoked out the lighthouse, held it ran as an underground station or a departure point again for another few years until the government came back and took it over again. So 1855 is when they finally re-established it, and that is actually the number that's actually welded on the door there. So that's why in this one. Let me just kind of run through here. That's the Hitchcock House. That's about a mile away from the Nissan Bottom Ferry House. I'll tell you the story with that one later, and I'll get to this image as well. This is an Egypt plantation in Egypt, Texas, outside of Wharton, Texas. And okay, we get to the last underground site that I'm going to tell you the story about, and this is the only one that actually takes three different pieces to tell the story. This is um, the home of the Smith House in Cutler, Ohio, and according to the story, old man Smith, and you actually have um, a fireplace, and you have uh, the um, attic that wraps around the fireplace, so people were sheltered in this house um, in the winter, and they were kept warm. Um, but according to the story, old man Smith was sitting out in his porch, a posse rode up on horseback with a warrant, and they said that they were going to... Uh, get with a warrant to arrest Smith for being an underground conductor. And according to the story, old man Smith kind of sat, you know, rocked back in his chair and said, you may take me in, but it won't be today. Pointed up. The posse followed his finger up, and on the second floor, there was a son with a rifle in each one of the windows aimed down at the posse. <laughs> they rode off. They never, they did not serve the warrant then and didn't come back either. So at any rate, what you also have at the same site are the outbuildings, which is incredible because the barns are the first things that usually go. So I heard so many stories about the barns as a hideaway and they were gone. This place, you had several outbuildings that were used, and this is not the family cemetery either. So these are a couple people who had died probably in passage or who stayed on to help. Um, there's a longer story on this, but it really is hard to eat um, a pickle on pickle jarring day. Um, and photograph the site at the same time. Um, and like I said, each one of these are many more stories. However, when things really got hot and heavy, um, what they found is that um, they would then have to leave the property and go down the hill to these two shelter bluffs where they were hidden. And what looks like a shark's tooth over to your left is actually a piece of pottery shard dated to um, early to mid 1800s. It's there. So these are shelter bluffs, um, meaning not quite a cave deep kind of going into. So yeah. And so um, that's it for the Underground Railroad portion. Um, there's one piece that's hanging up here, and what you actually see on this chest is this. It's an 1846 um, auction house in Charleston, South Carolina that sold slaves. And um, so the piece is actually anchored in the courthouse grounds of Kent, Mississippi, where, I, where my grandmother, great-grandmother, and great-great-grandmother lived. My grandmother was born there. My great-great-grandmother had been a slave in that area. So this is right on the courthouse grounds. Now, are there any questions at all? You talked about, yes, in your book, you mentioned the amount of memory or megabytes that you had to use for all these images. And yes. You know how to put them together. Um, it changes. Um, I was very fortunate. I was sponsored by Olympus, so I got, their, you know, so I received their cameras. And so, basically, the camera that I worked with was usually the next to the most recent one that they sent me. Um, anytime I got a, a brand new camera, like just before I was leaving on a trip, they were excited I'd be photographing. I'm like, nope, this one is staying at home because I needed to know the piece of equipment backwards and forwards before I could count on it. I needed to test it out, become familiar with it. So um, yeah, so it is kind of outrageous in terms of maybe the number of images, the strategy for it, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I mean, but primarily the book is done with cameras as, uh, there are images in here that are as low as two megapixel cameras. 
and probably the highest is maybe only 10 or 12. But the other thing is, these are stitched together. So all of a sudden you have a 10 megabyte image, you know, 10 megapixel image with another 10, and another 10, you may have like a one, one you know, megapixel overlap, but you also end up with a very large file being able to put it together. And I did these, um, there wasn't really stitching software out there that would put them together well enough, so I did them by hand first. And uh, now I sometimes use some of the automatic, automatic functions just to double check it. Now, are you ready for this? This is a piece where I'm going to show you the exact images that we use to construct the piece. This is the Nishibana Ferry House in, Southwest, in uh, southwestern Iowa. It's about a mile away from the Hitchcock House. People showed at the Hitchcock House sometimes for weeks uh, at a time. They were then brought down to the river. The guy would come out, um, come over with the boat, pick them up, take them across, and head on to possibly Chicago, Detroit, or into Canada. Now, the letter that you see over there is actually this letter right here. It's from 1836. It's owned by John Ford in Pittsburgh. It is actually of a slaveholder ordering shoes for his slaves. So on the bottom of that list are their names and their shoe sizes. And no, you cannot get shoes made like that nowadays. Not down to an eighth of, uh, an eighth of a size. Okay? Now, what you also have is, this is the image. Anybody have any questions? Oh, come on. You should have a couple of questions. You did want to see the niche about the fairy house, right? Okay. So I had to actually um, walk on the other side of the trees. Photograph it. Yes, please. Which one? No. No. The one where just the landscape. Just the landscape. Just the landscape. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. It looks like there's an outbuilding in the middle of the tree, almost yeah. like a pop-up pavilion. And then one you mean like the one here? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, but the one that I was most concerned about is actually this one. That's actually that's actually the Nishabat in the Ferry House. So at any rate, um, well, this, what I'm actually showing you is actually the images that were kind of used to make that piece. But like I said, you did want to see the Nishabat in the Ferry House. So I walked over to the other side of the trees. That's where you get this image from. Mm. Now, anybody else have any other questions? Mm. Like, what happened to the river? Mm. Well, yeah. the Army Corps of Engineers <laughs> moved the river by 100 yards. Mm. I'm a wow. photographer that works digitally. I walked 100 yards. I went and got the river. Uh -huh. So I walked and photographed the river from one side <laughs> of the bridge and then photographed the river from the other side of the bridge. <laughs> and so then I went back and said, OK, I need some more landscape. And by the way, one thing I should show you is that going in this direction, it's part of the Underground Railroad. Coming in this direction, that's why you have the signage and the scaffolding and everything oh, okay. up here. And that identifies it actually as part of the Mormon Trail coming in the direction, coming back out of the screen. So then I also need a little bit more field there as well. And then that is the piece. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm going to do one more real quickly. And this is um, the one with the brand. And so what you have is the shotgun houses in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Oh, yeah. Um, you look at the power lines now because you will not see those power lines later. And those are, you know, you have the railroad tracks right there, and the wrought iron is there too. That's one image. I then photographed this letter from the Mississippi State Archives um, of a slaveholder that didn't want to um, let his slaves go. And this is one of the only ones you can actually see with the tech, where I didn't actually photograph the letter itself. It's owned by somebody in the community. But I was making some pieces for them. This is the guy outside uh, a party in Starkville. Um, this is handheld on that upper right hand corner. I'm actually blocking the light flare. I would have shot it with a flash, I would have made several other images, except the police pulled up and said, either y'all go inside or move on down the block, I'm taking you in. So the curator was with me, with two storefronts away, he said, what's going on? I said, believe me, I know exactly what's going on here, we have to move, I'll tell you later. And so then this is cotton from uh, Mississippi State's fields. This is the plow in the Smith Roberts Museum in Jackson on its pedestal, and that's the piece. Okay? So like I said, you're actually seeing the actual, the actual uh, images here. Okay? Now, how are we doing time-wise? What do I have? you have a little bit more time? Two minutes? Oh, that's going to be tough. That's going to be real tough. Um, let me see here. Um, more. More. More, 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 more. Oh, that's fantastic. All right. I'm going to stop here. Well, not stop. I'm going to show you this. This is actually a $23,000 commission that I did for Avalon Library in Chicago. So what I did was came in, photographed around the community. They sent me a little Xerox. I made a little mock-up. And then I sort of created this piece that is permanently installed there. So I did research around the area. Chicago was part of the Underground Railroad. Photographed around the community. Part of the reason why Avalon was dealt had to do with um, new technology and drainage, but also the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago, which is why you see some of the illustrations from that. The little pieces that you see are 4 by um, 6 feet. The big one you see here is 4 by 14 feet. And it was meant specifically for that site. So you have Arrow Washington's Key to the City. 
um, the story, um, the handwritten, I mean, the um, typewritten story called Big Boy by Langston Hughes with the handwritten corrections. Um, you have the Avalon Theater, which later became the, um, that later became the, um, the New Beagle Theater, etc. And the little thing I could tell you is there was a lady in a, in a beauty parlor who I was photographing, and she was uh, under the dryer for an hour, so they asked me to leave and come back in an hour, so I did. I took a walk, and what I actually found was a sheepdog being sheared. <laughs> photographed that, and um, no, you will not see the lady in the beauty parlor. She got beat up by the dog. But that's another story. So then you have the piece here. Now, what you have here is where I ended up um, applying and also um, for two different um, commission projects in Chicago um, at 47th Street and uh, 79th Street for the Dan Ryan train station. So this is sort of the little mock up board proposals that I turned in for 47th Street. These are the little mock ups that I turned in for 79th Street. And I'm very sorry to tell you that I, I got a rejection letter that I did not get the commission for 47th Street. I was allowed to turn in two proposals. I could only possibly get one. So I get this rejection letter, and I'm really, of course, very upset. I mean, come on, it's, you know, it's a major commission. I'm from Chicago. And so um, I was disappointed, and, uh, and it said, if you just turn the page, on the next page, you'll see the different sites and different commissions. So I turn the page, and I look down, and here's my name under 79th Street. And I called up on the phone because um, later because I thought that was really very ironic because you have to realize that I actually found out I got a $90,000 commission from a rejection letter. I didn't get the acceptance letter for two more weeks. So needless to say, that's the favorite, my, my, you know, the fa my most favorite, you know, rejection letter I've ever gotten. So at any rate, I ended up sort of, you know, looking at how to match out some of the pieces. These are pieces supposed to go above the doors, but um, we weren't able to do that. And so we had to kind of pull back from that. And so what was actually done was these two pieces here. And this is the first one, and since it was for CTA, that's why you have the guy at 79th and Cottage Grove in 2006. And then when you go to the next piece, you have, and that's why you have the old tracks and everything, and that's why you have that same intersection from 1934. Now, I didn't know when they were gonna put the piece up, otherwise I would've flown to Chicago for this. However, my dad went. And so my dad photographed the installation, I'll show you those images, but he came back home and asked me, you know, so we talked a little bit about it, and I told him who some of the people were. So for one, you actually have Johnson here, who was um, um, one of the underground uh, gentlemen, who was one of the underground conductors in Chicago. Uh, that's why you have the running man symbol here. But I also asked my dad if he saw the lady with the platinum blonde throne. He said, yes, I did. She had two faces. I said, well, actually, only one face is hers. He goes, what do you mean? And he said, well, which one? I said, it's the profile. He said, well, who is the other one? I laughed. I said, that's you when you were 14. So my dad had to go back, and I snuck him in there. So at any rate, these are the pieces here. And this is insulation. So they are 4 by 10 and 4 by 13 feet encased in glass, special framing around it. They had to stop the trains in this, in this section to actually anchor them into the I-beams of the station. And this is my dad doing these photographs here. And then when they were up, they had a professional photographer come in and actually photograph the installation. So there's no text, so people going up and down the escalator actually see them from both directions. The things came from some of the archives in Chicago, photo people that I photographed on the streets, etc. And these pieces are um, still hanging, you know, it's permanent installation that's there. So I was very fortunate to kind of have that opportunity to kind of create, you know, this piece here, and that's in their brochure on the under, on their different um, on their different sites. Now, um, are we out of time? Or do we have a little bit more time? It's that time. All right. Let's see how we do this. <coughs> you know, I can do that. It's going to be a little rough. I don't want to go. <laughs> All right, I'm going to leave you with a couple of images here where this is some of, some of the brand new work. What I've been doing is, I'm, you know, right now I'm running on a grant from the Arizona Council for the Arts and I'm photographing some of the different historic African American sites in the states of Arizona and California. What you see is the illustration of um, black gold miners and what you actually had was slave labor in California. People do not think that that was the case.